Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We have the pleasure of having Tom Anderson with us today. Tom is a New York Times bestselling author and a nationally renowned financial planning expert. He's also the founder and CEO of the Supernova Companies, a financial technology firm. And today, he's here to tell us about his new book, The Value of Debt and Wealth Building. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. So tell us what inspired you to write the book. Well, I had written two books before, and so the first one uh, wasn't really specific enough, and it didn't get into what are the right types of debt. And so I did my second one, which was about retirement. But then what people said is, well, I want something for my stages of life. Uh, what do I do about student debt? And what do I do about mortgages and credit cards? And how much home should I buy? And, and so I wanted to give something specific and actionable that was geared to people throughout all phases of life. We traditionally hear that taking on debt is bad. Just debt is bad for a lot of different reasons. Why do you say that this type of thinking isn't right? Well, first of all, I, there are bad types of debt, and people shouldn't have, uh, this isn't just about having debt for debt's sake. Uh, I break debt into different categories, what I call oppressive, working, and enriching debt. And so if you have oppressive debt, you know, like a credit card at 19%, then you want to get rid of that as fast as you can. That's going to just crush you. Um, but working debt is things like a mortgage, and, and then we'll talk about different types of debt as we kind of move through. But if you have uh, a mortgage or student debt that's at a low rate, and you pay that down, many times you can't get that money back. And so what I try to prioritize is the difference between liquidity and kind of racing to pay down that debt just to get rid of it. So you just mentioned there's three types of debt. Mm -hmm. Tell us what those three types are and the differences between them. Yeah, so if you think about it, um, oppressive debt will be any debt that has a rate greater than 10% in your life. I'd even really kind of say like 8%. If you think about it, low cost debt's gonna be good because there's a chance that maybe you could have a rate of return that's higher. But if you have high cost debt, that's gonna be bad because it's, you, know, you, you, you can't get a return equal to that by investing in things. So for example, if you have a credit card at 15% and you step in and pay that down, you get a guaranteed return of 15%. I don't know of anything that offers a guaranteed return of 15%. That's oppressive debt that you have to get rid of right away. Mm -hmm. Working debt would be things like a mortgage. Let's say that you have a mortgage at 4 or 5% and your CPA says it's fully tax deductible to you. If your after-tax cost of that is 3 4%, then you might not want to race to pay that down. That's when you want to start to value the liquidity. Enriching debt we get into much later in the book, and it's kind of the later phases of life, but it's when you're choosing to have debt. Apple today came out. They have about $100 billion worth of debt. They also have a lot of cash. Why does Apple do that? It's not because the CFO is a, you know, doesn't know what he's doing. Um, uh, they're one of the most valuable companies. Apple values the liquidity, the flexibility, and the tax benefits associated with that debt. And so enriching debt is when you start to think like a personal CFO and learn from the ideas that companies do. Why would you say there's such a disconnect between the way companies and CFOs think about debt and use debt versus the way individuals do? I think it's a lack of education, which is something that I think is really interesting about Sarder TV and the things that you do here. It's about lifelong learning. And when you think about it, I went to you know, undergraduate business school at Washington University. Uh, my MBA is from the University of Chicago. I studied at the London School of Economics. My SEMA is from Wharton. In all of that process, how many classes do you think I've had on personal debt and personal debt structures? Not one. And so we literally just uh, don't have education on this topic. And so what I try to do is take, I borrow from ideas in the corporate finance world and I make them more conservative, applying them to individuals and break our life into different phases. And so if we kind of look at our life and phases and say, how can we learn from all of the Nobel Prizes and work that has been done in corporate finance and apply that to our life? And you also made note in your book that some 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the biggest problem. So after 2008, a lot of people said, hey, debt's what caused this crisis. I'm going to rush in and pay down my debt. But let's look at that. Let's say that I have student debt and I pay down $10,000 on my student debt. Conventional wisdom would say that's great. You're doing the exact right thing that you're supposed to. But a lot of millennials and other people throughout life lose their job or want to make a job change and find that they're trapped. If I pay down that $10,000 and I lose my job, I can't get it back. If that debt had a cost of it of 3% and I had that money in my checking account, then yes, I get it. I'm earning less in my checking account than I'm paying on that debt. 
But if I have liquidity and flexibility, I can make it through the storms and curveballs that life sends us all. So how do we get a balanced approach and a framework of what's a reasonable amount of liquidity to have? And that's where we kind of start the process through life. Now, although every person's financials are different, is there an ideal debt ratio that we should be striving for? So in my first book, I basically had a ratio. I took corporate finance ideas and made it more conservative. And that was subject to a lot of criticism, which is fairly fair. The next book, I basically looked at retirement and I said, hey, if you have a net worth greater than 30 times your annual income, you don't need to have a lot of debt. But if you're retired, you might need to have debt to have a bigger pie. But I couldn't get into something that was specific and actionable for people in the early stages of life. So I went to the uh, Museum of Science and Industry and I ran into an exhibit on phi. Have you ever heard of this number before? No. Um, it's an irrational number that's related to the number pi that a lot of people know of from circles and things like that. Well, phi is often called the divine ratio or God's ratio. Da Vinci was obsessed with it. If you've ever seen the Vitruvian Man, uh, it's all about the proportions that we have. And so the ancient Greeks uh, uh, had this, the Parthenon has all of these things. The reason it's called God's ratio is if you look at like a snail or a sunflower, uh, a hurricane in the Milky Way, they all have the same proportions. And so when I saw that exhibit, what I said is, how can we take this balance that we see in art and nature, Mozart, Beethoven, all apply it to their music uh, and apply it to our life? Phi is just one number. It's derived through something called the Fibonacci sequence. If you've ever seen the Da Vinci Code, it's in kind of part of the uh, beginning. But that gives you a series of ratios. And so what I've done here is basically taken your life, broken it into four different stages, and applied the divine ratio to a balance, to what would balance look like in nature. Uh, and then I challenge that versus conventional wisdom and show why it's mathematically better. How do you assess whether it is better to pay down debt or, or not? You talk about the after-tax cost of debt. How do we assess what that is for us? Yeah, so the first step is uh, to eliminate oppressive debt. But I really have a tough trade-off on trying to determine if step one is getting three to six months of cash built up or eliminating oppressive debt. I really want people to break the check-to-check -check cycle and I want them to not have oppressive debt. That's all about the first phase of this book. So get rid of oppressive debt. Any debt that has a rate greater than 8%, I need you to get rid of it right away but I also need you to build up a cash reserve so that you're not in that check-to-check -check mentality. That's when you just get crushed and when you don't have liquidity and flexibility in times of emergency. How does the power of compounding work when it comes to debt? Well, uh, what happens is if you have high interest rate debt uh, and it, then it's compounding, you get crushed on it. And that's why that oppressive debt becomes so difficult. But what becomes po the power of compounding is very interesting when you think about savings. You see, conventional wisdom, most people say, I'm going to slam money into my retirement plan and pay down my debt as fast as I can. And that's the glide path that they're on for life. Well, when you do that, most people wake up massively undersaved when they're 50 years old, and they're trying to just save all of the money they need for retirement over that last 15-year period of time. I basically say in this book, we could do a different approach. What if we don't race to pay down all types of debt? We pay down our bad debt, we keep our good debt, and we build up our savings. This lets you benefit from the power of compound interest for a 35-year period of time instead of a 10-year period of time. The difference is it's just logarithmic, and, and that's why the book mathematically proves that you can make it if you build up your savings early. You can't make it if you save later. It's not possible. Now, your book also outlines, and you mentioned this, four different stages or phases to achieving that balance uh, and financial freedom. Can you outline what those four phases are? Yep. So the first phase is, uh, they're the phases of life. Uh, so we call them the launch phase. Uh, that's when your net worth is between zero and 50% of your annual income. So let's say that you make $100,000. If your net worth is between zero and $50,000, you're in the launch phase of life. Uh, the next phase is the independence phase, when you're between 50% and two times your annual income. Freedom phase is when you're between two times your annual income and five times. And then equilibrium is when you're between basically that five times and 20 to 25 times your annual income. During that first phase, the mm -hmm. launch phase, what are some things that we should be doing and be aware of when it comes to debt? Yes. 
my rough math is that 50% of America is in the launch phase. We're check to check with a net worth of, uh, you know, most people have a net worth of less than $50,000. Average income is around that $50,000. And so we don't have the savings and liquidity built up. So step one, pay down oppressive debt. Step two, build up a, a, a cash reserve. And step three, don't take on any other form of debt. I don't want you taking on in that phase, everything including you know car loans. Um, I don't want people buying houses too early in life. I think during that time you have to rent because it's a form of insurance that protects you. We race to take on too much debt too early in life. And when you're in the launch phase, you just need to get that stable base and foundation. Once you get to the next phases, you can look at doing much more fun things, but you gotta get past launch first. What are your thoughts on taking out money from your 401k if you're in need of cash? I've never seen a situation where taking a loan from your 401k would be better than having the cash on hand. So uh, life sends us so many different curveballs. What you want to have is just an arsenal of weapons that you can turn to when a curveball comes. The best one is cash. Money in your checking account, money in your savings account will get you through any storm. You also want to have access to lines of credit. So I think people should have credit cards. They just shouldn't have a balance on them. But if you had a credit card that you could turn to, that's a great form of, of money that you could use in an emergency, but it, we want it to be that emergency situation. Could you, in an ultimate emergency, take a loan from your retirement plan? Some plans will allow that, some plans don't. Uh, the interest and taxes become very complicated. For me, any money that's going into those retirement plans, really you want to be setting aside and covering the debt to your future self, right? Because that money is sitting there so that you can retire in the future. So if you break that emergency window and access that money, you're putting in jeopardy a different phase of your life. And so I'd rather that you have the right tools to navigate storms without that. What, how do we assess whether it's the right time for us to buy or is it the right time for us to rent? What are some of the differences? Yeah, first of all, until your net worth is greater than 50% uh, of your annual income, so that that's, this is kind of a low bar for the conversation, but a lot of people are so anxious to buy homes that I really want your net worth to be closer to one to two times your annual income before you even look at it. The other thing is I think you need to think about how long you're going to be in that property. You see, home ownership is great if you're there for a long period of time, but a lot of times when you get your first home, you're only there for you know three or five years. And there's so many closing costs with purchasing a home. And then when you turn around and sell it, um, I bought a house and then right after I bought it, the furnace went out and I had to put $6,000 into a furnace. That's not fun because you don't, like you had heat and then you have, still have heat. Doing a roof repair, all of these things, uh, you, you take on these burdens of expenses, but you don't have the liquidity and flexibility to cover them. There's a lot of risk with home ownership early in life. Once you think you're gonna be in a property for more than five years and you're on a little bit stronger financial ground, it's a great time to look at uh, renting versus buying. And buying, if you're going to be in a property for a long period of time, can make a lot of sense at that stage. And what are your thoughts on paying down uh, your mortgage or you know, paying down the principal um, of the, the property that you've bought versus not? I hate it. I don't see any reason to pay down the principal. And you can say, well, why is that? Uh, what I'd rather do, so mortgage interest, especially in the United States of America, uh, under the current tax code, uh, is not only uh, at a low rate, it's tax deductible for most borrowers. And you need to speak with your tax advisor to get that understanding. But you have access to low cost money for a long period of time. That is the best form of working debt. If I can take that money that I would have been paying down on my house and build up my savings, that money will then work for me for a long period of time. When you follow the glide paths I outline, when you get to retirement, you definitely can step in and pay down your house. But until you've built up enough money to pay off your house, I don't think you want to put down a dime on your house. Now, of course, you need to make the minimum payment on your mortgage, but I want you to build up those assets. And once you have assets built up, all the power and flexibility goes to you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I actually walked by the uh, national debt clock uh, when I was on the way to the studio and it was coming in at uh, $20 trillion, which is amazing when you think about where our federal debt is. Over time, historically, what you have is inflation after follows periods of debt. We've been in a low inflation period, but you might have higher inflation in the future. You might have higher rates in the future. If you could borrow money for a long period of time at an after-tax cost of 3 or 4%, all I need to do is earn a rate of return of you know, inflation plus 4%, right? In this environment, that'd be six. And that difference doesn't sound like much. This isn't about getting returns of 
eight, 10 or 12 percent. And you know, I'm well aware of stock markets at all time high, so it's not about that. But if you can capture a small spread over a long period of time, the difference in compounding is huge. It mathematically proved that you'll be on track if you can capture just a small spread. Can you uh, briefly describe what the after tax cost of debt is? Yeah. So let's say that um, I borrow at a rate of um, 6% for easy math um, on my mortgage, and my CPA says that I'm in the 33% tax bracket. Then 2% of that is actually coming back to me as tax benefits. So 6 minus 2 would mean that my actual cost of it is really only 4%. The government is effectively subsidizing that 2% by giving you a tax break. That not only happens in mortgages, but some forms of student debt are very advantageous from a tax perspective. Not all forms. And so what you need to know is what's that after-tax cost of debt. Because sometimes if you pay down debt, you end up paying more taxes. And people have to factor that into the overall equation. So you also mentioned oppressive debt, like credit card debt. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of debts that we should be paying down and we should be just uh, getting rid of. Any other types of oppressive debt that we should be thinking about? Well, I think a lot of people will do things like um, uh, they'll go furniture shopping and they'll say, you know, oh, there's no payments for X period of time. And so people are taking on these debts saying that maybe it's at a low interest rate and therefore they're pulling forward consumption of things that they cannot actually afford, if that makes sense. So there are examples, uh, if you can't afford to buy the chair, then you shouldn't be buying the chair. Even if the interest rate is zero, you're taking on a debt but you need to have a plan around how you're going to do that. So there, we have so many forms of debt that people turn to to just get the things that they want all the time. My book is not about buying things that you can't afford. It's about better ways to pay for things that you can afford. Mm -hmm. And so this is what happened in 2008, would you this say? This is exactly what happened in 2008. It's what America is about. How can we pull forward as much consumption as we can? And what I want to do is make sure that we're not doing that, that we're doing a balanced approach to our life. Phase three of life mm -hmm. is called freedom. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about this phase and some of the things that we should be aware of in this phase. So freedom is a great phase when you come into it. So now at that point in time, your net worth is starting to be five times your annual income. So if you make $50,000, it would be a $250,000 net worth. If you make $100,000, you're coming into $500,000 of net worth. And what happens is once you get to that freedom phase, Money causes a lot of stress and anxiety around the kitchen table. It's one of the leading causes of divorce and fights that happen within families. That freedom is when anxiety just absolutely starts to go away because you're not living check to check. You don't have oppressive debt. You don't feel like you have too much debt in your life. You have a plan around the debt that you have and you can see a path to retirement. And so when you have that feeling, when you put your head on the pillow, you literally sleep differently. Uh, the freedom phase is truly about freedom. And even if you have debt in your life, but you have a plan around that debt, you can feel freedom. Have you seen just from your research that, you know, by a certain age, this is when people hit certain stages? Yeah, so I've been trying to think about that with respect to the book quite a bit. And uh, generally, um, when people are kind of right out of college, I really start the book closer to 25 because I think you're just kind of trying to, you know, enjoy those first years out of school and, and so forth. And then what I'd like to see is people over the first few years of their career focus on not having oppressive debt, building up liquidity, getting through the launch phase. If you can enter the independence phase at age 30, then that 35 year time horizon, this book mathematically proves that you will be on track. Uh, you have to stress test your own assumptions for what you think with return, but using very conservative return assumptions, you can be on track if you enter it by uh, 30 years old for the independence phase. Mm -hmm. So that next phase is you're going to start to enter that when you cross about two times. So hopefully that's like around 35. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you're starting to kind of get to that, you know, five times and greater, which is when you're getting into that equilibrium zone as you're getting closer to 40. But during your 30s, a lot of times people are really trying to balance life. I want to enjoy life. I want to live in a great house. I want to pay down my student debt. I want to be saving for the future. And so as, as money comes in, how do we prioritize enjoying life, saving for the future, paying down debt? I mean, that's a big tug of war. And so that 30s, you're, most people will find that they're somewhere between launch, independence, or entering freedom. You need to have a comprehensive plan in order to reduce anxiety during those critical years in life. Many or companies 
that obviously use debt to finance their operations. Can you talk a little bit more about how organizations actually do that? What is it that they're looking at and what they're looking for that we can get some uh, examples? Sure. So the term, people like to use the word personal CFO, but what we really have to do is look at what do CFOs do. If I'm the CFO of a publicly traded company, all that I'm trying to figure out is what's the right capital structure for that company. You see, if I don't take on enough debt, then someone like Carl Icahn gets crabby with me, comes along, buys the company, takes me private, levers it, and turns around and sells it, and I lose my job that way. If I take on too much debt and a crisis comes, then the company goes bankrupt and I lose my job that way. So all that a CFO is trying to do is optimize that amount of debt. And if they don't have the right amount, then markets will correct it. People, however, aren't, don't operate that same way. I can't step in and buy you and lever you appropriately and turn around and sell you. So people are allowed to have these massively inefficient capital ratios where most people either have way too much debt or they have too little. And I want to take an optimal balanced middle ground. Now, look, companies are in the business of probabilities and people are in the business of surviving first and foremost. So Walmart has like a million employees and that's like great. And if they went bankrupt, that would be terrible for those million people. My family, I have three kids and uh, I am their income source and they're dependent upon me. If I went bankrupt, I don't know how they would eat. And so you might consider me a selfish jerk, but I care more about these three kids than you know a million people, right? That's the most important thing. So I take corporate debt ideas and I make them more conservative and applying them to an individual. But what they do is they embrace that balance and number two, they focus on liquidity. Those are the two things that companies do all the time. Okay, so you told us a little bit about phase three, free, the freedom phase, mm -hmm. phase four is equilibrium. Tell us about a case study to kind of demonstrate what these phases might look like in real life. Sure, so let's kind of look at that um, uh, equilibrium phase. You've um, purchased a home. It's a lot of what we were talking about before. So imagine that you're 40 years old, you maybe have a couple of children, uh, you have a house, that things are really going the right way. I think that what a lot of people think is, I'm 40, I want to retire in 25 years, I might like to retire earlier than that, therefore I'm going to follow conventional wisdom and pay off my house. I think that's kind of the normal process that people think. And when you're in that phase, what you're going to see is I basically am just trying to hit people over the head over and over and over again. Those are great intentions. But what you need to do is number one, stay out of that oppressive debt trap. That always has to be front and center. Number two, don't race to pay down your good debt. And so the case studies that I walk through in the book basically say, build up those assets, those liquid investment assets in your retirement plan and in your taxable portfolio, so your after-tax assets. And if you have both of those buckets that are building up, you're going to feel much less anxiety in your life, you're gonna feel much more peace, and you're gonna feel that you have a clear path to retirement. That's what the case studies are all about in the book, is they are very specific. I walk you through one family, and then I give you a worksheet that you can apply to your own life and say, where am I and where should I be directing my savings as I go forward and how can I be on track too? You also talk about a bonus phase called no debt. Yes. Tell us about what that phase is. So um, the, the equilibrium phase, the final one kind of goes so to, between something like five times your annual income and there's a jump ball here that's between 20 and 30 times. And so the bonus phase comes in, I like to kind of cut the middle there, at about 30 times your annual income uh, or 25. And so why is this? If you have $100,000 of annual income and your net worth is more than uh, $3 million, or if you have a million dollars of income and your net worth is more than $30 million, then I can't mathematically prove to you that you need debt because you can retire. Because if you have a 3% rate of return on that, it will generate enough for you to survive. And when you get to even 20 times your annual income, it's harder to say, do you need debt? Because you're gonna be kind of okay. If I have 100,000 of income and 2 million of assets, I don't necessarily need to have debt. That's the bonus phase, you can choose. But until your net worth is more than 20 times your annual income, you have a debt to your future self you need to create your own pension because most people don't have pensions anymore. And so we need to build up our savings. And so what this book is about is how do I build up my savings? And until you get to that bonus phase, you have a debt to your future self. Therefore, you need to use all of the tools and resources to have the highest probability of success. 
your book talks a lot about debt. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one chapter where you talk about the other side of the balance sheet. Yes. And that's the assets. Yes. What should we be aware of here? Oh, that right now is the most painful time for this book to come out. Uh, the stock market is at uh, all-time highs. Um, bond market basically prices, when interest rates are at all-time lows, bond prices are basically at all-time highs. And it's not just in the United States. A lot of markets around the world are, are very expensive. We've been in a bull market really since the 2008. So we're now in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, coming into 17. These are great years of returns, and now a book comes out, The Value of Debt. Oh, geez. Um, I think that, uh, number one, to prove a point, uh, I place a $100,000 bet to charity in the book that the real return of the any combination, you pick it, between U.S. stocks and U.S. bonds will be less than 3% over the next five years. So I think that we're in for a period of disappointing returns in U.S. stocks and bonds because they're trading at record high prices. I think that uh, we will have a crisis in the future. I think that the, you will have a crisis in your life, you're young, uh, that will be worse than 2008. And so um, I think people need to be prepared for bear markets. They need to be prepared for crises worse than 2008. They need to be prepared for returns that might be very disappointing. And so in that chapter, I really address, well, what should people be doing if there's a lot of risk out there with how things are trading today? So what is it that we should be doing to better prepare ourselves for things like this? Absolutely, you can be prepared for that. So uh, the specifics on how is basically there are many assets around the world that are trading at inexpensive prices. And so I first of all frame a world neutral framework. The United States is only in the mid 20s of global GDP. And if stock market equity capitalization, it's in the mid 40s. And so there's an incredible place called the rest of the world. And a lot of times when people uh, diversify, what they do is they go into Japan or to Europe that are really facing the same challenges of debt and demographics. I think there's an incredible space called the rest of the world uh, that most people are massively underinvested in and should be looking at. So I talk about emerging market stocks, emerging market bonds. I talk about commodities. I talk about covering all of the bases. And then I put a framework about how you could determine what are things that might be expensive at any point in time and inexpensive and how you might kind of change those weightings. But you have to get both sides of the balance sheet right. So it, you have to always be sort of rebalancing your portfolio. Always sure. rebalancing the portfolio. So I provide a framework around 10 different asset classes and how you should be looking at those with respect to trying to shoot for a return of inflation plus 4% and why I think that there's a high probability of success that you can earn inflation plus 4%. Now, there's no guarantees in investing, but you can look at um, history and math and valuation. And so I basically overlay a series of Nobel Prizes to combine them to show a framework for asset allocation. I think it should be the starting place for conversations is building upon all of the great theories that have been done in finance, which is not put your money into a U.S. stock and bond portfolio. Tell us about some of the things that we should be aware of or be looking out for when we do decide that we want to invest in the rest of the world. Uh, I think investing is a lot like baseball. Um, uh, if I was up to bat playing the New York Yankees uh, and they were pitching and this was a real contest, uh, they would cover all of the bases, right? There's almost no chance that I'm going to hit the ball into the far left field. It's, the pitchers are amazing, right? And I'm a lousy baseball player. But yet they would cover all of the bases. Sometimes they'd maybe move the players in, sometimes they would move them out. I think you have to take a world neutral framework, cover all of the bases around the world, and then look at valuation using something called Schiller PE multiples. You won a Nobel Prize on this framework. And then that might be your basis for what you want to kind of move in or where you want to move out. The other thing is you want to have low fees. So in general, I like indexing over active management. Um, if people can justify the story for active management, I think you need to really closely look at it. There are a few examples where it stands out, but I think there's a lot to be said for um, Eugene Fama's position on passive investing. So low fees cover the bases. Yeah. What regions and industries, generally speaking, do you favor today? So today, I really like emerging market stocks at these valuation levels. I like emerging market bonds. If you invest in an emerging market bond that's paying you 4% and the dollar falls by 4%, then you're up 8% and you did it in bonds. Not only are U.S. stocks trading at record high prices, bonds trading at low prices, our currency is very, very highly valued around the world. And traditionally, whenever you have a high level of debt in a country, you either solve that through growth 
inflation or devaluation. And while growth is a possibility, I think if interest rates start to rise, there could be some challenges to that. After World War II, we had a tremendous amount of growth, but we also had a tremendous amount of inflation and devaluation. And so I think smart money should be starting to move to position toward inflation and devaluation. One of the best ways to express that view is actually through borrowing. So if you could borrow in a currency at record low rates and record high valuation, I think it's actually a really good time to implement the ideas. So tell us a little bit more about your financial philosophy. Well, first of all, I think that what a lot of conventional wisdom is, is that people look back at trends that have happened over the past 30 years. Stocks have done this and therefore think that that has something to do with the future. And what I think what you have to do is kind of eliminate that time period because the one thing I know is that that time period will not be our future. Uh, just think back to uh, 1980, interest rates were high, today interest rates are low. Um, in 1980, stock market valuations were near generational lows, now they're at generational highs. In 1980, inflation was high, today inflation is low. In 1980, government debt was low, and today government debt is high. In 1980, we didn't have the entitlement obligations that we're facing as a country. Basically, zero macroeconomic trends that w were in place from 1980 are in common with the starting place of where we are today. So what you need to do is take the steps to look at economic history and say, well, what has happened to other countries throughout time that have had a debt to GDP ratio where ours is today? And I think what happens is, is that economic history is cruel to people that overweight their home country when they have high levels of debt. Basically, when you have a high level of debt, you know that something weird is gonna happen, but you don't know what and you don't know when. Those are the kind of the unfortunate things. But what you do know is that at some point in time, if you do not have growth, what you will end up with is a cycle of inflation and devaluation. And that's how these ideas become very, very interconnected. Every time in our history when we've had high levels of debt before, what has followed that are periods of inflation. And so we want to be thinking about how we can be prepared for that future economic environment. But any data that anyone tells you about that past period of 1980 to 2017, I would say completely throw it out and you should only be looking at other data sets as you're looking at returns going forward. Which country would you say has a similar um, data set to where the U.S. is today when it comes to economics? Well, I think that um, when people invest their money abroad, they tend to look at uh, Europe, Japan, and the United States. And so I remember I was told a diversified portfolio in the year 2000 was Microsoft, Cisco, and Intel. <laughs> and the reason is because one's a hardware maker, uh, one's a connector, uh, and one's a software maker. And of course, those industries have nothing in common with each other. And if you believe the internet's going to grow, then these will all be great investments. Well, it turns out that in the tech rec, uh, all of them were perfectly correlated uh, going uh, straight down, and that was not a diversified portfolio, and they had a lot in common. And even though the theme of the internet will grow is exactly right, that was hard from a valuation and timing perspective. That wasn't actually diversification. I think there's similarities between that story and the United States, Europe, and Japan that all are facing a lot of the very much the same structural issues. But there are incredible opportunities in places like um, Central and South America, um, uh, other countries throughout the world that have fabulous demographics, um, much lower debt ratios, much higher growth, incredible opportunities for infrastructure, great uh, stable political environments. And, you know, it's, without singling out any specific country, um, that opportunity set I just think is absolutely uh, vast for investors today. You talk about three buckets of money, mm -hmm. conservative, core, and aggressive. Yes. What are the differences in those? So this is one of the most important things for investors to think about throughout their life. I tell some stories and I kind of tease myself, but going back to that same 2000 uh, time period, uh, I fell in love with someone and uh, uh, we were going to get married and I bought a ring and uh, so you know we were going to get a house and I took all of this money. Uh, for her ring and I ended up putting into a, a technology stock and that stock went from basically a hundred dollars a share to four dollars a share. I wanted it to go from a hundred dollars to three hundred but that's not how the world of uh, investing works. What I should have done is realized I had a very short time period and so I needed to invest that in a safe way. And I think people have to understand time horizons. So what I basically do is say we have three buckets. We all have some money at some point in our life that we need to have safe. And so that safety bucket should not be measured for its rate of return. It should be measured, is it safe? 
she would have liked the ring money to be safe, right? <laughs> and the house down payment money needed to be safe. I shouldn't have been investing that in a risky uh, framework. Core is really your personal foundation and endowment. It's really trying to shoot for inflation plus four to 5%. Um, uh, just that long-term kind of steam engine chugging down the track, not paying attention to the day-to-day -day movement of markets because markets will always go up and down. It's that long-term investment horizon. Aggressive is where you're doing kind of more tactical ideas and maybe you, you want to pick a stock or um, sometimes people think it's sexier fun to, to trade into some type of an investment. What I have found is that that aggressive bucket, too many people try to do trades early in their life um, where what they should be focused on is building up that safety bucket and just that very boring diversified portfolio and not getting into that kind of day-to-day -day stock trading and picking because it's just very difficult for those ideas to come together. You might have one or two wins, um, but you have one or two losses and it offsets. And I tell some stories that kind of tease about my past in the book on that too. So you've laid out this path in your book, you know, the, fa the four phases of life. Um, how do you assess whether this is the right path for you? Would you say this is the right path for everyone to follow? If your net worth is more than 30 times your annual income, then I don't think it necessarily, uh, you get a whole lot of choices. If your net worth is less than 30 times your annual income, I'd like this to set the bar. And so, first of all, I assume that you're gonna be disciplined and rational and that you can handle the ideas in the book. So sometimes if people pay down their oppressive debt and build up cash, they say, oh, I have money again, and they go out and they buy stupid things that they can't afford. So. If you're not going to be disciplined and rational and you can't handle money in your checking account and money in your investment account and truly be a saver, then I don't know what to recommend for you, right? Um, assuming that you are disciplined and rational, then I think this needs to set the bar for applying the framework to you. You might believe that returns will be higher than I think, then I think this will only add value. If you think returns in the future are going to be lower than what I'm talking about, then you actually need to have more assets and more savings working for you. But at the end of the day, look, if you don't have any rate of return, if you want to retire at 65 and we live to be 100, right, that's 35 years. If you want to work from 30 to 65, if you saved 100% of your income and there's no inflation, then that would be, you'd have to do, so if we want to retire, we have to have a framework through which we can build up enough savings to be able to retire. And I think this sets the bar. And from here, I hope people can take it and make it better for their personal situation. What are some other things that conventional wisdom says about investing in debt that you think are unfounded? Uh, we just have this, uh, uh, in personal finance, uh, anti-debt hysteria, where a lot of people just scold you. And, and there's a lot of times where people say things like, pay off your lowest balance credit card uh, instead of your highest interest rate card. And people say that because they're saying, well, you just got one checked off the list and move forward. Well, I kind of like paying off the highest interest rate because you're getting the best return. And so I guess within some of the conventional wisdom, it, it has definitely added value to a, a segment of society. Um, and I do think that a lot of people don't necessarily have the discipline or capability to embrace debt. And so I think maybe those ideas are exactly right. But we then as a society have taken those ideas and extrapolated them across everybody else in every other situation. And I think that that's crazy. I think how can we embrace, uh, we're in New York City, like this is the capital of uh, capitalism and companies using optimal debt structures. There has to be a balanced middle ground and that's where I think the problem is with uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, there's a better way and I think we can learn from that. The other thing you talk about in your book is securities-based loans. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what that is and how we can use that to our advantage. So I think a lot of the um, uh, way that debt is structured today is people say, I want to get a car, so I get a car loan. I want to get a boat, so I get a boat loan. If you're investing in a restaurant, you go to a bank and you get a restaurant loan, and that's the way that people think about debt. I think people should think more like companies. Companies say what are their total assets and they borrow at the lowest cost. So Apple, who's been issuing all these bonds, doesn't go out and issue a desk bond, right? They have a good bunch of desks. They issue a bond against the company. A securities-based loan works the same way. If you're fortunate enough to have liquid investable assets, which the balanced approach to life helps you build up, then you can have a line of credit against that portfolio. Those lines of credits in this environment typically start at rates that are around prime and actually go down from there. So let's say that 
you wanted to buy a $50,000 car and you did it on a securities based line of credit, as long as your line is in good standing, 3% times $50,000 would be $1,500 a year. $1,500 divided by 12 would be $125 a month. You don't even have to make a monthly payment if you don't want to. So if you think about a car payment of zero and you choose how much principal you want to pay down any time that you want, or $1,600 a month on a traditional loan, the freedom and flexibility that you get is not just about rate, it's about the flexibility that a securities-based loan delivers. But many people, at a restaurant loan at 8% versus a you know, securities-based line of credit at 3 it's, it's the lowest cost form of borrowing. It was The top 1% of America uses it all the time. There's a segment of 20% of America that isn't even aware about the tool and how it can be powerful for them. Right. So if you have a stock portfolio or a bond portfolio, what you're saying is that you can borrow against that for paying down something or paying for something else. That's exactly right. Now, you want to borrow, if you think about if you have a $200,000 portfolio, you might have a $100,000 line of credit. In that framework, I recommend that you never borrow more than $50,000 against it. So basically, your loan to value, I want you to stay under 25%. Um, making sure that you always have plenty of room because again, I think the next crisis will be worse than 2008. So you need to have a diversified portfolio and really manage the risks of this tool. But if you manage the risks the right way, it is perhaps the most powerful form of borrowing for society. Tell us about your past and some of the experiences that shaped uh, you writing this book. Yeah, well, so I had a, a few great ideas um, and uh, uh, at an early stage took a relatively low amount of money and uh, um, uh, grew it uh, dramatically. So in tactical trades, I made about uh, one and a half million dollars off of a pretty low base, and that was uh, pretty proud and a uh, great accomplishment. Uh, I did also, though, along the way with those tactical trades, uh, lost something between uh, 1.2 and 1.8. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the wins felt great, the losses were awful, and I don't think any of it was worth the uh, headache or anxiety. I would have rather had the boring portfolio and probably been about $300,000 wealthier along the way. So um, the wins can't offset the loss of the, uh, uh, the pain from the losses enough. One of your books focuses on retirement yes. specifically. Tell us about some of the things briefly that during the phase of retirement or to get to retirement, what are some of the things that we should be doing and looking out for? Yeah, so it's a, a mathematical proof that debt can increase the return in your portfolio. Uh, it's also a mathematical proof that debt can reduce taxes and counterintuitively debt can reduce risk and that's what the last book was all about. And so as we get closer to retirement, those are all things that you want. You want higher return, you want less taxes, um, and you want less risk because you want the highest probability of not running out of money. For so many people who are close to retirement, they're massively undersaved for retirement. People are not on track in America, and yet they're racing to pay down their mortgages and then saying, why don't I have enough money to be on track to retire? So what I basically do is this book going into that book is a baton handing off. And so, you know, for readers that are kind of closer to 55 years old and getting close to retirement, you need to be thinking about having all the tools and resources to have the highest probability of success. Debt can be an appropriate tool. The right debt struck the right way with the right amount of balance. And that's what that book's about. So you've written two other books as well. One yeah. is on retirement, which, which we just discussed. And there's another book that you wrote. Um, tell us about that book. So The Value of Debt, the first one that came out, uh, uh, I call it The Red Book, um, was really written to financial advisors. A little bit about my history, I was in investment banking uh, and I became a financial advisor and I couldn't really differentiate myself by saying my large cap growth fund is better than yours. I, I wanted to apply a, a comprehensive uh, wealth management philosophy, managing both sides of the balance sheet, thinking and acting like a personal CFO. I hit the road and was coaching and training a lot of financial advisors and um, people said, hey, do you have some material around this? So it's really much more of an academic book, ap applying financial theory, really written to industry professionals and practitioners. Individuals, I think, very much benefit from it, but it was too conceptual. And so what we took with these next books is a much more specific and actionable plan to both retirement and building wealth. So these are much more written to individuals. The other one's really written more to investing professionals. And tell us a little bit about your professional journey and how you got to where you are today. So uh, my professional journey, so after uh, college I was in investment banking out here in New York and uh, then I did become a financial advisor and worked at uh, two of the largest firms on Wall Street. 
was coaching and training a lot of financial advisors and uh, these independent financial advisors said to me, hey, I, I love these ideas about lending and lending solutions. How do I do that? And I said, well, just set up a line of credit and do a securities-based line of credit like we were talking about. And they said, well, I, I can't do that. And so what happens in uh, wealth management is you basically have one group of firms that have profit margins of greater than 20% and another group that has profit margins of less than 10%. And that gap really is lending. And there's a whole group of firms that can't deliver lending solutions to their clients. And so what we did is uh, uh, left in, uh, my former employer to create a, a technology firm. It's a financial technology firm that's designed around delivering education tools and solutions uh, to financial advisors. And the primary solution is delivering responsible lending. Because if you get integrated comprehensive advice, that's the best advice. Mm -hmm. And the, the name of that company is Supernova, Supernova Companies. Supernova That's exactly right. Yeah. When did you start the company? So um, companies kind of go through a lot of different uh, stages. A lot of 2014 was this architecture and planning, and it was built on the legacy of the education platform. So the education platform's been around for quite a while. 2015 is when the company was actually formed, but the challenges of delivering lending solutions, you're taking banks, custodians, advisors, and clients and connecting them was uh, uh, larger than I had even initially anticipated. You basically have to figure out you know, how you're going to sell and distribute the product, how you're going to build the technology platform, how you're going to comply with the regulatory environment, and then you have to solve how you're going to fund uh, the loans. Um, so we're basically a team of former Merrill Lynch executives uh, and former Morningstar executives. Um, Morningstar is a, a great technology company in our hometown of Chicago. Um, and a lot of those technologies are really kind of kissing cousins. But it really is finance and technology coming together to deliver a much more integrated lending solution to people. What's the experience been like being an entrepreneur? Uh, it's been great. It's a roller coaster. It goes through a lot of uh, uh, different times. Uh, uh, you get to go through a lot of soul searching. I will tell you, I felt a lot better having some liquidity and flexibility uh, by coming into the uh, uh, journey. Um, but uh, right now, I, I couldn't be more proud of the organization. Uh, it's amazing to see what we have uh, coming together. We're in the middle of three very large technology installations that I'm uh, incredibly excited about. Um, and the demand for our product has been uh, bigger than I actually had originally anticipated. So uh, it's a good problem for us to be facing, but it creates uh, challenges in a different level. We're really trying to find the right uh, talent and spending a lot of time recruiting. Yeah. Any lessons learned that you can pass on uh, throughout your journey as an entrepreneur? Boy, that would be a long list in itself. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to spend time. Uh, uh, I was fortunate to be able to really explore the idea before completely uh, jumping. And so um, you need to really test the market demand and your ability to execute. And so if you think you have a great idea, that's awesome. That's, that's kind of like step one to entrepreneurship. But the next two things are really showing that you have true market demand, uh, that people are willing to pay for your product, and that you can execute on that vision, really put the team together. That requires a lot more soul searching, processing to figure out on both sides, uh, will that be possible? If that's possible, if you have a vision, can execute, and you have client demand, then you should take the journey and do it. Great. This was really good, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thanks.